What's up guys, Miles here with 9to5Mac, and for the past year or so, I've been using the 2018 i5 Mac Mini as my primary machine for content creation. Uh, I've got 20 gigs of RAM installed with an RX 570 GPU connected through Thunderbolt 3. Both of those things have helped performance a ton, but lately I've been pushing the machine more and more, and I'm starting to feel as though I'm hitting a wall in terms of performance. So I did a bit of research as far as looking into seeing how big of a difference it would be if I were to upgrade to the i7 version of the Mac Mini. And oddly enough, I didn't find anything, I didn't find much on YouTube as far as a direct comparison between the two for video editing performance and stuff like that. So. I went ahead and just bought the i7 Mac Mini to not only see for myself if the difference is going to be substantial, but to bring this comparison to you guys. So we're going to do a direct comparison between the i5 and i7 Mac Mini for video editing performance, uh, just to see how big of a difference it is, because if not, then it might be going back. But without further ado, let's dive right in. If you're looking to secure and protect the users on your domain, then you might want to check out Zero SSL, who's sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube. As the first real alternative to Let's Encrypt, Zero SSL offers completely free SSL certificates through a super simple and intuitive interface. In addition to both offering API and Acme, Zero SSL has a really user-friendly API that allows the user to create 90-day and one-year validity certificates through an extremely seamless process. Try Zero SSL for free in the link in the description below. Thanks to Zero SSL for sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube. So I just got the new i7 Mini in the office and I just finished my RAM upgrade and now I'm about to do a migration from the i5 model to the i7. This is essentially just cloning the data from the i5 to the i7 model so everything on here will be exactly the same on the i7 model. Uh, and this is from a built-in tool that's built into Mac OS. Uh, and Apple lets you do this via two options. You can either do it through a network or through Thunderbolt 3. I've done it through a network before and it can kind of be painfully slow, especially with hundreds of gigs of data. So I think we know which option we're gonna try. I just kind of want to see how fast this is gonna be. Wow, that Thunderbolt 3 is quick. I transferred about 230 gigabytes in about eight minutes, which is really impressive. But anyway, I'm gonna test a couple of different export settings for the Mac Minis here. We're gonna benchmark export speeds for 4K H.264 footage, 4K RAW footage, and some 6K RAW footage. And for each video, we're gonna test export speeds for exporting to ProRes and H.264. And all of this is footage that I've shot and played with on the i5 Mac Mini before. And I'm doing this to showcase the most realistic use case scenarios for videographers and editors who might be interested in picking up either the i5 or i7 Mac Mini. I also chose to export all of my footage to an external scratch disk. And for this, I'm gonna be using the Fledging Shell Thunder. It's a really well-made and lightning quick Thunderbolt 3 drive that I use quite often as a scratch disk for editing content. But without further ado, let's get into the tests. So I ran all the tests yesterday and here are the results. Overall, this is pretty close. The i5 definitely held its own against the i7. Or you could look at it as the i7 not being that much better than the i5 overall, at least for this use case scenario. Either way, you can see that the i7 variant of this computer isn't necessarily an entire tier above the i5 in the same way that the i5 processor is pretty much a full tier above the i3 version of the Mac Mini. The most taxing exports is where you're going to see the i7 truly outshine the i5, but overall, we're not exactly looking at a blowout here. So that's it as far as the pure numbers go, but I did have some more notes as far as general usability and performance differences. But firstly, I'd like to address the RAM situation. So even though these comparisons were as close as they were, some people might say that the tests were biased towards the i7 because it had 36 gigs of RAM while the i5 version only had 20. Well, firstly, due to the amount of RAM sticks I had and what they added up to, I couldn't have had 
20 gigs or 36 gigs in both machines simultaneously. And secondly, exporting content from Final Cut isn't really a RAM heavy process. And I know this because I checked the stats uh, during each and every export and on both machines that it pretty much never exceeded any more than six or seven gigabytes of RAM usage. So I don't think it had a direct impact on performance as far as these exports go. As far as thermals, both machines pretty much behaved the same. When exporting and working with the Sony 4K footage, both minis floated between 175 and 185 degrees. Uh, but when working with the raw red and Canon footage, uh, both minis floated around 195 to 209 degrees, which I guess to an extent is to be expected. Uh, converting raw video to H.264 is a bigger job for the computer than converting H.264 video to H.264. What about general performance and fluidity differences? Well, I've only had the i7 model for about a day or so, but when using it for my everyday tasks, it honestly doesn't feel that much different uh, than the i5 Mac Mini. I definitely wouldn't call it drastic. I'd say opening applications is slightly faster. It's noticeably faster, but not by much. And I'd say logging in after a shutdown is a little bit quicker. Things like that, you're going to notice an improvement in speed, but I definitely wouldn't call it anything crazy. I think the general takeaway here is that for video editors, if you're working with compressed 4K video footage from cameras like like the Sony a7 III, Canon EOS R, Fuji X-T4, cameras like that, then I'd say the i7 is definitely not needed over the i5 model. But if you're working with raw footage from cameras like the Reds, the Canon cinema cameras, Ari, stuff like that, um, then I will say that while the i7 isn't necessarily needed over the i5 model in this case, this is where you're gonna see the biggest differences in performance. The i7 is just gonna handle those heavier files noticeably better than the i5 can. But I will say that for anyone who's looking for an i7 mini, unless you need to do something else with that $200 upgrade cost, then you might as well go with the i7. You never know how much power you're gonna need down the road. I think I'm personally gonna keep the i7 Mac mini. I'm not gonna return it. And that's simply because, uh, like I said, I'm sure I'm gonna need that little bit of extra bandwidth down the road as I grow in video production quality. And secondly, I only paid $10.99 for this Mac mini. I'll have a link down below for where I got it from B&A paid 1099 got the i7 8 gig 256 model if you just spec that up throw in some extra ram connect a thunderbolt ssd eGPU, you're golden and that's under two thousand dollars you could do that uh and thirdly um once i get rid of the i5 mac mini there won't be that huge of a loss probably less than 250 dollars total which is perfectly fine to me just thinking of it as like a slightly expensive or slightly more expensive i7 upgrade directly from apple but that's about it for this one. Everything I mentioned in this video, the Mac minis, the RAM, eGPU, graphics card, all that stuff will be down in the description down below. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for future content like this. Thank you all for watching and I'll talk to you in the next one. Once again, thanks to Zero SSL for sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube. If you're looking to secure and protect the users on your domain, then you might want to check out Zero SSL. As the first real alternative to Let's Encrypt, Zero SSL offers completely free SSL certificates through a super simple and intuitive interface. In addition to both offering API and Acme, Zero SSL has a really user-friendly API that allows the user to create 90-day and one-year validity certificates through an extremely seamless process. They're also beta testing their own Acme server that'll be released in May and allow existing Acme and Let's Encrypt users to automate certificates through Zero SSL. Try Zero SSL today for free in the link in the description. Thanks to Zero SSL for sponsoring 9to5Mac on YouTube.